This is Rodney Robertson. I'd like to welcome everyone to our monthly Research Advisory Board webinar. Um, you can see our agenda today. We're going to have some short introductions. Then we're honored to have Dr. Michael Green talk to us about nutrition, the emperor of health, and the maladies that afflict us all. And that's a topic that I think we're all going to have interest in. After Dr. Green's presentation, we'll have a, a, a quick question and answer session and, and then wrap up discussion. The webinar today will last for approximately one hour. All webinar participants are initially on mute, so please unmute yourself during the presentation by clicking on the green microphone button on the dashboard if you have a question or want to make a comment. We'll have a question and answer session at the end of the presentation. If you do not have a headset or some way of having voice capability on the webinar, you may submit your question in the question section of the dashboard and the moderator will read the question uh, at the end of the webinar. This webinar will be recorded, and so you can pass the link on to others who might want to view it in the future. If you want to go back and look at certain parts of it, uh, it will be posted on the Auburn University Research Advisory Board website, and the link is shown here. You are encouraged to pass this, the webinar link on to your colleagues or any other contacts that may have interest in the subject matter. If you know of people or organizations that may have interest in the research topic, then please pass that information to Dr. Green or let Vicki or myself one know and we'll get the information to Dr. Green. You'll find more information about Dr. Green's research at his lab website. His lab website is posted on the screen here and if you, if you don't get this information, then Vicki or I can certainly get it to you in the future. At the end of the webinar, you'll get a short survey. Uh, it's just very, very short. It takes only a short time to, to complete the, the survey. We'd appreciate it if you would complete the survey and get it back to us so we can improve these in the future. Our next webinar is tentatively is scheduled to occur during spring break, and that does not work well for the Auburn faculty making a presentation. So we tentatively scheduled it for March the 12th. Uh, which will be a week earlier, but we'll get information out well before the webinar so you have time to, to register for it. Our speaker today is Dr. Michael Green. He received his BS in Biology and Marine Science and his MS in Aquatic Toxicology. He obtained his PhD in Molecular and Cell Biology from the University of Connecticut. Following the awarding of his PhD, he did a joint industry academia postdoctoral fellowship between Pfizer in the Department of Cardiovascular and Metabolic Diseases and Sanford University in the Department of Molecular Pharmacology. He was then hired as a research scientist at Bassett Research Institute at the Mary Imogene Bassett Hospital in Cooperstown, New York. Bassett Hospital is a teaching hospital for Columbia University, College of Physicians and Surgeons. Bassett and Columbia now have a joint medical school which has the number one MCAT scores in the nation. Dr. Green joined the Auburn faculty in the Department of Nutrition, Dietetics, and Hospitality Management in 2012. And his research is focused on obesity-linked diseases. So Dr. Green will turn the webinar over to you. And I'm just waiting for my screen to pop up right now. So first I'd like to start out with talking a little bit about modern Western culture. And if we think about modern Western culture, uh, a lot of us will think about art. Uh, art as being a very important part of it. But also literature is very important, as is architecture. And certainly science is a very important for modern Western culture. But what we don't think about, and which is very important for modern Western culture, is that there's been a huge change in computers and in handheld devices and all the other various aspects of te technology that have really changed our lives. What's also occurring in modern Western culture is that there's an aging population. And what we think about in nutrition as part of modern Western culture is diet. And so diet has had a huge change uh, over time. And we know that diet is very important for health. And this was actually known long ago 
and even by the Greeks. And so Hippocrates said that if we could give every individual the right amount of nourishment and exercise, not too little, not too much, we could have found the safest way to help. So Hippocrates recognized that nutrition was critical to health, but what Hippocrates did not imagine is the Oreo cookie. And so what we know now is that modern society is associated with a diet that is very different, and how that a diet affects our health is critical. So what I'd like to do today is to use the cornucopia as a metaphor for nutrition research at Auburn University. And if we think about the cornucopia, it has a, it's a bounty of the harvest, and there's a variety associated with that bounty. As part of this, we have a basket that holds this huge amount of variety. And in nutrition research, what our basket is, is obesity. So obesity links the variety that we have. A lot of the nutrition faculty is interested in maladies that afflict us all, so such as cancer, diabetes, Alzheimer's, fatty liver disease. What we're also interested in is aging and food insecurity and dietary behaviors. We study a number of different tissues, including the brain, the pancreas, muscle, adipose tissue, and the liver, and we study a number of different nutrients and hormones, nutrients such as glucose, fat, omega-3 fatty acids, and hormones such as insulin. What I'd like to talk to you today is about the faculty interests in nutrition here at Auburn University. I'd like to first start with research in the Matthews Laboratory. This is Dr. Suresh Matthews, and he's interested in mechanisms of insulin resistance. Insulin resistance is associated with prediabetes, and what he's been interested in is the role of a very particular molecule called fetuin A and its role in insulin action. He's also interested in looking at biomarkers of childhood obesity. Another area of interest for Dr. Matthews Lab is bioactive components in improving insulin action and glucose metabolism. So this research is really directed at looking at diabetes. And what he's been studying here is the service berry and also curcumin, which is the spice from curry. And he's been looking at coat buttons and also resveratrol or metabolites of resveratrol. And these are compounds found in red wine that I'll also be talking about later. So as part of Dr. Matthews' research, he's been looking at this, com this molecule called fetuin A and whether it's playing a role in obese in individuals. If we look at the risk of type 2 by diabetes, we know that waist circumference is an important risk factor, as are serum lipids, blood pressure, and other hormones. Also, fasting glucose, serum insulin, and insulin resistance play a role in risk. What Dr. Matthews is interested in is whether fetuin A is actually involved in risk of type 2 diabetes and obesity. So he conducted a study in which he looked at obese individuals that were losing weight. And so they were on this weight loss program. And what these individuals were able to achieve was about a 10% weight loss. And so he then looked at these individuals that were undergoing weight loss and found that fetuin A decreased in a manner in which the, most, the people that lost the most weight had the biggest decrease in fetuin A. So it appears that fetuin A seems to be a marker for obesity. And this may be a potential marker for later risk for type 2 diabetes. Dr. Matthews has a team of individuals working for him, including PhD students and master's students. I next like to turn your attention to the work of Dr. Patty Marinchik. And she is a um, head of the dietetics program here at Auburn University. And she's really interested in translational research. And so her research interests are in medical nutrition therapy, or MNT. And she, what she's interested in here is cancer treatment. So are we giving cancer patients the right type of nutrition so that we can not only have them healthy, but also hoping that we're not actually fueling the cancer. She's also interested in cancer etiology of esophageal cancer. So esophageal cancer is linked to obesity, but there may be other nutrients that are involved in this uh, 
obesity-linked esophageal cancer. She's also interested in bariatric surgery. In particular, are we giving individuals that have undergone bariatric surgery, which is used to treat morbid obesity, um, are we giving these individuals the right nu nutrients? Because we know that there's huge problems in the absorption of nutrients in individuals that have had this drastic surgery. Finally, she's interested in the interaction between infant feeding, this would be breastfeeding, and chronic diseases such as type 1 and type 2 diabetes and how those interact. Dr. Mrenchek is also interested and has really a vision for research in which registered dietitians can team up with physicians to have an intervention in the primary care setting. And so her idea here is that we could be working on the obesity and diabetes prevention and management. In addition, breastfeeding promotion, and clearly these are all interrelated. So as a team, can we work together with on the nutrient end, nutrition end, and the physician end to combat some of these maladies that are really afflicting us all? I'd like to next turn your attention to research in Dr. Doug White's laboratory. He's interested in obesity, diabetes, and leptin. And so leptin is this hormone that is produced by the fat and it plays a role in feeding. So we actually have a hormone that is released from the fat, communicates with the brain to regulate our feeding. And so if we look at mice that don't have leptin or rats that produce a mutant leptin receptor, what we see in those animals is that they get a little chubby. And so here's an example over on the right of a mouse that weighs about twice the amount of two regular mice. So this mouse does not produce leptin. Here we have a rat on the left that produces a mutant receptor. So it gets a little bit chubby compared to its litter mate. So what we know from these animals that don't produce leptin or have mutant receptors for leptin is that they become obese, but they, some of them actually become diabetic too. What's important about this is that most people appear to be resistant to the effects of, in, of leptin. So leptin does not appear to be working in telling the brain basically to stop eating. So Dr. White had an initial observation and that was done using diabetic rats. And so in these diabetic rats, he administered leptin directly into the brain of these rats. And he then looked at the effect that leptin had on blood glucose concentrations. And so here we have a picture of one of the little beasties that's been cannulated. I'm talking about the rat here and not the graduate student. And so in this experiment, what he did, he had animals that were diabetic. And so shown here is the levels of glucose in these animals. So they have very high levels of glucose. So they're diabetic. And they were infused with just a controlled saline solution. And you can see that over time, there's no change in glucose concentration in these animals. However, in animals that receive leptin directly into the brain, their blood glucose levels dramatically dropped. So basically, these animals were cured of being diabetic. So what this doesn't mean, though, is we can't go around and putting needles into people's heads to inject it, leptin into there. So clearly, that's not going to work. But what this does tell us is that leptin is activating a brain pathway that appears to normalize blood glucose. And he has some experiments that are showing that this is actually independent of the hormone insulin. So the current thought for Dr. White's lab is that leptin is inhibiting the responsiveness of glucagon, which is a counter-regulatory hormone to insulin. And so what this is doing is it's decreasing the output of glucose by the liver. So the, the liver is a major site of producing glucose for the body. And this it is broken down in diabetics. And so as part of this, he's able to normalize blood glucose concentrations in diabetic rats. So Dr. White's focus is to identify these pathways involved and determine whether there are interventions that we can activate these same pathways. So this would hopefully be a potential way of treat, treating diabetes. I'd next like to turn your attention to the research interests of Dr. Claire Ziza. She's interested in how age and the environment 
and food insecurity all interact towards a diet. And so what I mean by food insecurity, I'm talking about the availability or access to high quality food. So Dr. Ziza is interested in how diet has an interplay between the food supply and the individual. So if you think about it, we can only eat the food that we can purchase and what there's actually there. So if you go to the grocery store, we can only eat what's there. And what the individual selects out of that is their diet. As a part of that, we can look at individual nutrients that the individual takes in. If we look at individual nutrients, we can look at the quality of those nutrients. We can also look at the pattern by which people take in these nutrients. As part of that pattern, we have regular meals, but there are also snacks. And so Dr. Ziza is very interested in actually snacks. And so she's also interested in the influence of snacking, and it varies between older adults and food insecure adults. So if we look at a continuum here of unhealthy snacking to healthy snacking, and when I mean unhealthy snacking, I'm talking about junk food. So food that has a lot of calories with little nutritional value. On the other end of that spectrum is healthy snacking, which would be nutrient dense food. And what she's found is that food insecure adults fall down into the snacking, unhealthy snacking, whereas older adults are actually snacking with healthy foods. So if we look at a conclusion from the U.S. Dietary Guidelines for Americans, I think it sums up what we know about snacking. And it's stated there that there's a limited body of evidence to support a positive relationship between snacking and increased food intakes. So generally, most people would think of snacking as being bad. You're eating too much, so snacking must not be good. Yet, we don't really know that well whether snacking is actually increasing the intakes of nutrients. Also, there's in inadequate evidence is available to evaluate the relationship between eating frequency and nutrient intakes. So clearly, more, need, more work needs to be done. But what we do know is the role of snacking and meal behavior depends on who you are. And for older adults, it appears to be a positive role. I'd next like to turn your attention to the research in my laboratory. And I'm interested in the link between obesity and cancer, so two of the major maladies that afflict us all. We're interested in how the role of Western diets and sugar have an effect on human colon cancer. We are also interested in the link between adipose tissue expansion, and so what I mean by that is we have our fat and it expands and can contract, but how does that expansion relate to fatty liver disease. For this work, we're interested in looking at the role of sugary drinks, fructose and sucrose, and Western diets. I'd first like to talk a little bit about the obesity and human cancer link. And so what we know is that obesity is linked to certain forms of human cancer. So individuals that are obese, they tend to have more cancers. And so unfortunately, or obviously we cannot study human cancer in people because we cannot give a human uh, cancer. So we have to have some sort of model to study this. And so I'm coming up with new animal models so we can study obesity and human cancer. And one of those models is we're using a, a strain of mice called a RAG1 mouse. And we can feed these mice a Western diet. And what that does is it induces obesity in these animals. And then we can study the growth of human cancer in these animals. And shown here is, is a picture of an animal that was on a high-fat diet and that we, had, we implanted in that animal a human colon cancer. And so you can see here the colon cancer is actually growing at the colon. Surrounded around the cancer is actually a lot of adipose tissue or fat tissue because this animal was on a high-fat diet. So we can study the effects of tumor growth in these animals that are obese. Not only can we study them at the end of an experiment, but we can actually study live animals and study the growth of the tumors as they occur. So shown here is an in vivo image of this cancer as it's growing in a live animal. We've actually expressed the fluorescent protein in, in the cancer cells so that we can visualize this. 
We've also been able to come up with another model, and that is a fatty nude rat. And shown here are those beasties. And so what we have here on the left are a bunch of nude rats. And you can see this rat is much larger and is obese compared to these lean rats. This is a fatty nude rat, and this is a, just a regular nude rat, and this is actually a heterozygous. So it has one of the genes that makes it fatty. Over on the right are just normal rats and that are not nude. And so this animal here you can see is obese compared to the lean ones. These normal rats, obese and lean, cannot accept, accept human cancers. These rats over on the left that are nude can accept human cancers. So we have another model of studying human cancer in, with obesity. And what's important about this model here with the rats, these rats are all eating the same diet. So they get obese because they overeat. So we have a diet-induced model and a genetic model to look at obesity and the connection between human cancer. So we have some key questions on this link between obesity and human cancer. One is obesity or that pathophysiology that's associated with obesity, which is insulin resistance or the inability of insulin to work as it should, and inflammation. And how are they linked to human colon cancer? We're interested in what's the mechanism that's driving this link. Also, what about other obesity-linked cancers? It's not just human colon cancer, but obesity is linked to breast cancer, ovarian cancer, pancreatic cancer. So there's a lot more work that can be done here. And so finally, what interventions can actually break this link? So can we actually come up with targets so that we can actually treat these cancers in people that are obese? Because remember, about two-thirds of our population is either overweight or obese. Next, I'd like to turn your attention to some studies that we have on fatty liver disease and adipose tissue expansion. So for this studies, we're very interested in the Western diet. And so what I have shown here is an example of a typical Western diet. So this is fatty foods, also with processed foods. So we have the, the bun is very processed, as is ketchup. Ketchup is a very processed food. But what's missing from this meal is the drink. So a soda is a very common part of a meal. If here in the South, this could be sweet tea. So if you go to a, say, a fast food place, a restaurant, when you order a meal, it always comes with a soda. So we are consuming high-fat diets together with sugary drinks. So we wanted to actually model this in animals. And so what we used to model this is a mouse. And shown here is our mouse that we study, and this is a, called a black six mouse. And the reason we use this mouse is because it's susceptible to obesity. And so what we did is we placed these mice on four different diets. And so what we had was a, a low-fat diet, and this had a mixture of lard, butter, fat, and Crisco, and only 12% of the kilocalories came from fat. We also put them on a high-fat diet, which 40% of the kilocalories were from fat, and also composed of lard, equally of lard, butter, fat, and Crisco. And then to each of these diets, we had groups of animals that had a sugary drink. So we added fructose and sucrose sugars to their drinking water so that they are always consuming it. So they now had, some animals had a high-fat diet to go along with their sugary drink. And so what we found in these animals is that the animals that were on the high-fat diets with the sugary drink, they gained the most weight. And they gained much more weight than animals that are just on a high-fat diet alone. Interestingly, though, we found that the animals on the, on the low-fat diet with the sugary drink really didn't gain any more weight if they are just eating a regular low-fat diet or just a typical chow diet that mice eat. So we next wanted to look at fatty liver disease in these animals. And we actually use a number of different ways of looking at it. I'm only just showing you one. But, and this is liver weight. And so if you think about uh, as animals and people, as we get larger, our liver proportionally gets larger. So a large animal will have a large liver. But what we're looking at here is liver weight that's normalized to the body weight. So is proportionally the liver much larger? And so what we found is that in animals that were on the diets for 12 weeks, only the animals that were on the high fat plus sugar diet had this elevated liver weight, which is indicative of fatty liver disease. And so what this is happening here is we have typically a normal healthy liver, and it becomes enlarged 
and engulfed with fat. And the reason this is important is because a fatty liver can lead to cirrhosis of the liver. And I think most people have heard about alcoholic cirrhosis. Well, you can also get cirrhosis of the liver just from non-alcoholic mechanisms, and so having a fatty liver. Cirrhosis of the liver is important because this can lead to liver cancer. So these are very serious clinical conditions. We have many questions that need to be answered on the role of sugary drink consumption. And one of the approaches that we're taking is a genomics approach. So we're working with Hudson Alpha up in Huntsville to look at the expression of genes in animals that are on this combination diet of high fat plus sugar. The work in my laboratory is done as, as a team. And so I have a postdoctoral fellow in the lab, Dr. Amory O'Neill. Uh, PhD student, master's student, research assistant, and undergraduates also participating in the research. Next, I'd like to turn your attention to the research interests of Yi Ming Li. She's interested in actually food allergies. And one of the things that she's interested in is how restaurants prepare, what their preparedness is about food allergies. And this can be at the level of employee training. Also, how, what are the strategies to accommodate clients that have food allergies? And how can you maximize customer engagement, loyalty, and revenue? She's also interested in dining behaviors of individuals with food allergies, and how do they select restaurants based upon them having a food allergy? She's also very interested in how technology can interface and how that plays a role in food allergies. Since technology is so pervasive, uh, social media has really changed uh, everything. So how is this interacting with uh, food allergies? Finally, she's also interested in food safety. So what is the safety performances of restaurants? How, what are the behaviors of the food handlers when they're preparing the food? And what are the training methods that are used? And, and how effective really are those training methods? Next, I'd like to turn your attention to research in the Huggins lab. This is Dr. Kevin Huggins. And he's interested in omega-3 fatty acids and the regulation of adipocyte function. So adipocytes are fat cells. He's specifically interested in the potential of steroidonic acid-enriched oils as a therapy for obesity and type 2 diabetes. Steroidonic acid, this is a plant-based omega-3 fatty acid. And shown over on the right here is the structure of steroidonic acid. And so this is actually a possible alternative to fish-based omega-3 fatty acids. So the fish-based omega-3 fatty acids are EPA and DHA, which you will find in a lot of health food stores. Steroidonic acid is found in ICOM and also ahi flour and black currant seed oils. And so here's shown a picture of the ahi flower. Typically, it's thought of as a weed, but now there's a lot of culture going on of the ahi flower because it's so rich in this omega-3 fatty acid. I'd like to also mention that some companies are actually formulating uh, genetically modified soybean oil so that it has more steroidonic acid. So what Dr. Huggins is interested in looking at is steroidonic acid, just abbreviated here as SDA, and how it can regulate lipid accumulation in fat cells. And so when he's looking at this, he's looking at fat cells cultured in the lab, and so the red color here is the accumulation of lipids. He wanted to compare steroidonic acid, SDA, to a plant-based omega-3 fatty acid, ALA, and to a marine oil-based omega-3 fatty acid, DHA. And so you can see that ALA, the plant-based omega-3 fatty acid, had no effect on lipid accumulation in these cultured fat cells, whereas SDA had a very similar effect to DHA in reducing the lipid accumulation in these fat cells. So some current studies for Dr. Huggins' lab is he wants to use Again, this animal model that we've been using also in my laboratory to study obesity. And he wants to feed them ahi flour oil and rich diets. See what effect it has on diet-induced obesity, what effect it has on inflammation, which we know is an, an important underlying factor associated with obesity, 
and also in glucose metabolism, which is very important for developing type 2 diabetes. And finally, I'd like to turn your attention to the work in Dr. Jagnathan's lab. Dr. Jagnathan is interested in the connection between Alzheimer's and type 2 diabetes. He's also interested in resveratrol and its effect on brain health. So, if we look at the percentage of change in the leading causes of death, and if we think about the leading causes of death, the number one leading cause of death in the United States is cardiovascular or heart disease. Number two is cancer, and number three is stroke. But if we look at the percentage change in these leading causes of death, it's Alzheimer's that has the biggest change. And this data is from 2000, 2005. And whereas heart disease, cancers, and stroke have been going down, actually, even though they're still very high, proportionally, we see a very large increase in Alzheimer's. So unfortunately, I have some sobering facts for you. And this is that every 71 seconds, someone in the USA develops Alzheimer's disease. And by mid-century, someone will develop Alzheimer's every 33 seconds. So Alzheimer's is really a huge problem. And I think it's hard to find a family or a neighbor that has not been afflicted by this disease. It's really quite the devastating disease. So the focus of Dr. Jake Nathan's lab is on um, this Alzheimer's and type 2 diabetes. And we know that type 2 diabetes in midlife is associated with an increase in risk of developing Alzheimer's disease in later life. But so far, exactly how type 2 diabetes and Alzheimer's are linked is not completely understood. And so if we think about some of the potential mechanisms, a lot of these potential mechanisms are really associated with Western diets. So what Dr. Jake Nathan is doing is he's using physiologically relevant models to study this link between diabetes and Alzheimer's. One is he's using post-mortem brain tissues. He's also using relevant animal models and cell culture systems to study this linkage. So his aim is to, to discover novel agents to disrupt this diabetes and Alzheimer's disease axis. As part of Dr. Jake Nathan's work, he's been looking at new players in insulin signaling. These new players, one of them is a receptor that he's found is being involved in insulin signaling, and another is a scaffolding protein. So these potential new players in insulin signaling may be links between diabetes, prediabetes, and Alzheimer's disease. Dr. Jake Nathan is also interested in the effect of resveratrol on brain health. Resveratrol is a polyphenol that's found in wine, and in particular, red wine. It's also found in grapes, though, too. And it may actually have effects on the brain. Dr. Jake Nathan has recently published an article where he treated animals, obese animals, with resveratrol and found that it was able to reduce oxidative damage. And we know oxidative damage is very important for the development of Alzheimer's. Dr. Jake Nathan has a team working with him of PhD students, master's students, and undergraduate students. So what I've shown you today is that nutrition research is being conducted on a lot of the maladies that afflict us all. And if we think about cancer, diabetes, Alzheimer's. So we have a variety of research in, our, in this area of nutrition. And looking at it in a bunch of different ways. What I'd like to share with you is our capacity for nutrition research. And our capacity really spans three different levels. One is looking at human studies, also animal studies, and cellular studies. So the studies can range from behavioral analyses all the way to imaging of humans or animals using our 7 Tesla MRI imager here at Auburn. We can also do genomics works on human tissue, animal tissue, or even uh, cells from tissue culture studies. So we have a, a, a very large capacity to undertake studies at multiple levels. Finally, what I'd like to share for you is just how nutrition can fit into interdisciplinary research. And so for this example, I'd like to use the obesity cancer link in which my laboratory is working on. 
So we're looking at this link from the nutrition perspective using these novel animal models that I showed you and also the cancer. We're working with Dr. Panisi over in Harrison School of Pharmacy who is an expert in imaging animals and also an expert in inflammation. We're also working with Dr. Chris Easley over in the College of Sciences and Mathematics. He is using, he's an expert in hormone analysis. In fact, he has very innovative ways of looking at hormones, really cutting edge work. We're also working with Dr. Elizabeth Lipke over in the Samuel Ginn College of Engineering. She is an expert in 3D cell culture, so we're trying to come up with a cellular model to look at this obesity cancer link. Finally, we are also working with Dr. Russ Catley in the College of Veterinary Medicine who is an expert in pathology and has been working with, on cancer for quite a number of years. We are all working together on this one problem in an interdisciplinary manner to tackle this really important problem of obesity and cancer and how they are linked together. So I want to thank you for being a part of this webinar and I would be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you. Any questions for Dr. Green? I did want to point out that Dr. Green's department is part of the College of Human Sciences. Also, I'd like to ask Mr. Stan Graves to make a few comments. Stan leads a research advisory board committee that sponsors these webinars. So, Stan, would you? Yes. Uh, thank you, Rodney and, and Vicki. And I hope the weather is, is OK where each and every one of you are. I'd like to thank Dr. Green uh, and all of our participants. Uh, Dr. Green, I guess the question I would always have is, those of us who are participants on this call or on this webinar, what can we do to assist you and Auburn University uh, to enhance your research efforts? Well, that's a great question. Uh, thank you. You know, I, th I think one of the things we need to think about is we have a health sciences initiative here at Auburn University. And so the question is, what are we doing towards this initiative? How are we promoting research, health sciences research on this campus. And I think what I touched upon here at the end, the interdisciplinary research. So can we support these groups that are working on these very important problems and they're working on it as a team effort because we think this team effort is our best chance of securing external funding. So if we can support these groups early on, these groups are going to be competitive for that external funding. And so the funding that I'm thinking of is National Institutes of Health funding. So I think if we can put our best people together, support them, we are going to bring more grant dollars into Auburn University. We're also going to raise the profile of health sciences research on this campus and show you know, the rest of the nation and the world that we, we are doing world-class research here at Auburn. I think the other thought that comes to mind in, in food safety is that with the proliferation of fast food restaurants and thousands or hundreds of thousands of entry level trainees, is there a market for um, a specific training program for a, and I'm sure many of them already have them, but for franchise food restaurants, how you might using this, the information derived there at Auburn, improve their food safety and you know that has a lot of components. It mm -hmm. helps them from a, from a PR standpoint, reduces the risk of bad PR, improves uh, food safety for those of us who are forced to eat at fast food. Right, right, right. yeah, no, I, I think that's, that's a great point. And, um, and, you know, we do have a Food Safety Institute here that I think is very interested in that exact uh, topic that, that you're questioning. And I think from the nutrition perspective, certainly I think the more we can educate individuals about nutrition too, it's going to help out there too. So I, I see it as both the safety aspect and just being more informed about the food that we're eating. And uh, so, yeah, I, I think that's a great point 
and uh, and I'd have to look into more on on what the the Food Safety Institute is doing, but I think training is a huge part of what they're interested in. And Rodney, on on something at a in Dr. Green, a much much lower level, I was at a Innovation Depot uh, board meeting yesterday, and we had one of the young companies there that makes an iced coffee product, and mm -hmm. and there is a shelf life issue with that. And okay. uh, Bill Goodrich, by the way, a former board member uh, for the Auburn Research Board, it's his niece. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they need some help from somebody, and I asked if they contacted Auburn, and I'm not sure they have, regarding how they might uh, take that product and, and add shelf life, uh, non-refrigerated shelf life. Right. Mm -hmm. So, so uh, if you can pass that along, uh, I'd be happy to introduce the appropriate person at Auburn to them. Okay, yeah, yeah, we, we certainly have people that are very interested in food science, and, uh, and they would certainly be the experts on that, no question about it. Well, I'm, I'm going to quit asking questions and thank you, and unless there are no other questions, uh, Rodney, uh, we'll, we'll sign off. Thanks a lot. Great, thanks. I would like to thank everybody for participating in the webinar. Dr. Green, thank you for participating in the webinar. Rodney, um, we have one more question. everybody, the webinar was re recorded, so there will be a link that will be available later if you pass on to other people who may be interested in the topic. And I'd also like to encourage everybody to go visit Dr. Green's website. Rodney? Yes. We do have a question. Um, okay. David McClary? Can you hear me? Let's see. One second. Vicki, I can hear you. Okay. I'm just trying to get David to speak, but I think he sent it in to me. It says, Cooperative Extension teaches serve safe throughout Alabama for those in the food service industry. I think that was in just in response to Stan's question. Um, but that comes from the Cooperative Extension for the university. All right. I think that's everything. Great. Well, thank you very much, Vicki, and thank you, Rodney. Thank, thank you, you Michael. We appreciate it. Hey, you're welcome.